I want to talk to you about my favorite phrase when it comes to motivating yourself. And I know if you've followed me for a while, you have heard me say this phrase before, but this is so accurate. It's so motivating. Uh, before I tell you what this phrase is, let me ask you, have you ever had an experience where you were so frustrated with yourself because you knew that there were things that you wanted to start doing or there were changes that you wanted to make or things that you wish you could prioritize and you just couldn't seem to pull yourself out of the day-to-day -day grind. That no matter how much you thought about it or contemplated it or just wanted things to change, that whether it was self-doubt or fear or the demands of your day-to-day -day life, you just couldn't seem to make traction on changing. Yeah, I see some of you going, yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm trying constantly and nothing's gaining traction. I feel frustrated all the time because as much as I think about the things that I really want to be doing, I don't see myself making forward progress, right? It's almost like when I was in college, or no, high school, when I was in high school, I had a gerbil named Ralph. And let me tell you about this gerbil, okay? <laughs> this gerbil made me kind of angry, honestly. And the reason why this gerbil made me kind of angry is because he was really, really quiet during the day. Like he would nestle into his like, you know, little shredded thing in the corner. And he never was that social or interested when I was um, walking into the room. And I'll tell you what, the second, the second that I would turn off the lights in my bedroom to go to sleep, that freaking gerbil would get on that wheel and just <laughs> And do you ever have a pet like that? Very nocturnal. We currently have a cat, Mr. Noodle. I see somebody going until midnight. Oh my gosh. Um, and when I get into those modes where there's something that I really want to do, like I feel this kind of friction and this frustration with myself because I know that I'm not as happy as I could be. I know that there's a change I need to make. I know that I'm focused on the wrong stuff. I know that my emotions are getting the best of me. I often feel like my mind is my gerbil Ralph on the hamster wheel, just spinning, 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 spinning. So can you relate to that? Can you relate to that? Yeah, of course you can, because that is like such a common experience of sort of knowing this thing that you want and you can just oh, reach it, but you, you don't have that sensation that you're actually grabbing it. Um, I'm so glad that so many of you relate to this because I've been thinking about this a lot and now I am of course overheating, so I'm gonna take off my sweater. That's what happens when you're 53. Um, and I think about this a lot because, you know, I see even people that I love struggling with this. We have a daughter who uh, is a singer songwriter studying pop music out at USC. She's got all the talent, all the resources, all the skills, and there's always something that is stopping her from just starting to put music out, right? Or maybe you can relate to that in health you really are like, this is the year, this is the year. Like for me, I keep thinking, I gotta like take some time to get the hormone thing. Uh, like just understand it. Like what food should I even be eating? And I think about it like that hamster on the wheel, but I can't seem to make myself launch forward. Uh, another example I can give you is for years, everybody, I dreamt of launching a podcast. And I would watch all these people that I admire out in the world launching a podcast. And I would just spin and spin and spin and spin and spin. And so I'm so glad that you can relate to this. So tell me, is there some project 
or some area of your life or a business or a goal or some change that you want to make that you feel like you think about all the time, but you just can't seem to push through all of that thinking or push through the, 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 the fatigue or the overwhelm or how do I get started, right? You can't seem to just push through. Is there some area of your life where you feel that way? If so, I want you to write it in the comments, okay? I see I want to work with animals. I see somebody going, oh my gosh, I keep thinking about doing a TikTok account. Oh, I want to get control of my addiction. Oh, I want to launch a business. Oh, I, I really want to get a degree, but I feel like it's too late. Um, and you may be telling yourself uh, that uh, it, things just feel like it's too late, Mel. Like I, I got a divorce and now it feels like my life is frozen. I see some of you saying. I feel like ever since I got the divorce or the pandemic hit or I lost the job or I took the wrong job or I moved to the wrong place or I realized that I wanted to start this thing and I started it but now it's stalled out and I'm embarrassed to keep starting. I want to finish my PhD. I want to be persistent with the gym. I want to get back to creating art. I see all this stuff that y'all are writing down. It's beautiful. I see so many of you saying that you have a little side hustle and you know that you want to turn your attention towards it, but you just can't seem to literally push through whatever it is, the fear, the overwhelm, the busyness of your life to laser focus on what really matters to you. And I think that's why it's so painful because you're not going to stop really wanting and longing for those things that you keep thinking about everybody. They're going to linger for the rest of your life. You're going to have to, at some point, make a decision that it is important enough to you to make changes so that the thing that you want to see happen or the life that you don't want to miss out on or the degree that you always longed to get or the way that you want to feel in your body or the energy for me a big theme uh, recently has been about loneliness I am so lonely in my personal life because of the pandemic because our kids have launched because we we're moving to Vermont because I'm always working like I can see very clearly that I have tried to solve loneliness in my personal life by working all the time. And that's not the right solution for loneliness. And so I even see all this. And so I'm glad that you can see an area of your life where you feel this friction and tension because you know that you want to focus more time and energy there, but there's so much resistance and there's so much friction and there's so much else going on that it is robbing you of the ability to push forward toward the life that you really want to be living. And look, it's not going to happen overnight, but so let me tell you, let me tell you this sentence, this truth about life that I truly love, that, that always kicks me in the rear end, honestly. And here it is. No one is coming. That's it. No one's coming. No one is going to come into your life and do the work for you. No one is going to come into your life and uh, just remove your problems. No one is going to come into your life and uh, make your dreams come true. When it comes to the changes that you want to make, when it comes to the things that you long for in your heart, when it comes to the music that you want to put out into the world or the TikTok account that you want to create or the degree that you want to get or the life you want to build after divorce or after your partner dies or after, you know, you change jobs or after the kids launch. When it comes to those things that you deeply long for, deserve and desire, no one's coming. You are not too late. If you're breathing, you're watching this video, you have plenty of time to create a life that makes you happy, to create a life that is full of meaning for you, whatever that means. You have plenty of time to take control, to heal. It is so important for you to hear that, that you have plenty of time. 
but no one's coming. At some point, you have to make a decision. And you'll often hear me say you're one decision away from a different life, a better life. But you have to make the decision. No one's coming to make the decision for you. You have to decide that you are done feeling beaten up. You're done feeling lost. You're done feeling stuck. You're done feeling isolated that all that crap that you've been enduring, you're freaking done. You have to decide that. And what's interesting is that once you decide, you realize no one's coming. Like I often joke that, you know, I'm not the kind of expert that really learns this stuff by reading it in a book. Unfortunately, I'm kind of a stubborn learner. So my life has required me to either fall into a hole or dig one for myself. And then I wallow at the bottom of the hole feeling sorry for myself and stuck and frustrated and angry. And then I realized, oh my God, nobody's coming. Like if I want to get out of this hole that I'm in emotionally, financially, health-wise, in my career, in my, whatever the hole may be, I got to build the ladder. And it's that decision. I'm not staying here. I don't know where I'm going, but it's not here. It's that decision, the decision that no one's coming to do this for me. I'm deciding that I want more. I'm deciding that these last two years where I felt like I got thrown into a dryer and life just tumbled me around and all of a sudden the dryer stopped and I'm like in there covered in lint and beaten up and staticky. We got to kick the door open, people. We got to make a decision that all that crap that you just struggled through and that you learned through, that it happened so that you could wake up and you could literally make a decision that the next freaking chapter of your life, you're not going to be unhappy. You're not going to just get by. You are gonna make a decision that you are gonna do the work to change. And here's what's fascinating. Once you decide, that's it, that's it. I'm changing, that's it. I'm gonna do the work, whatever it takes. I made a decision that our kids have left this house that we've raised them in. I'm here alone all the time working. I'm like, I'm sad. I'm miserable. I, like, I got to change. I can't just hold on and grip to what I know, especially if it's making me unhappy. And here's the thing, letting go, deciding that it's time for a change, that's a lot easier than gripping onto stuff that's no longer meant to you. And so when you make a decision, and I see so many of you going, my life fell apart after divorce, my life, uh, you know, blows because of my job. My life has been in stuck mode ever since this person I love died, or my life is just kind of boring and I miss having fun. Okay. Like when you kind of have that wake up moment and you're like, oh my God, nobody's going to come and do this for me. No friends are showing up to bring the, the party bus. If I want to have my life feel like a party bus, I got to be the one that actually is driving it. You know what I'm saying? So um, here's the cool thing. No one's coming. Once you make that decision, here's the cool thing. Everybody shows up when you ask for help. Everybody shows up when you ask for help. Do not try to change on your own. I tried that for so long. Yes, it's your responsibility. Yes, you need to the, do the work, but don't do it on your own. Do not do that. You know, I just got a text about 11 minutes ago from a really good friend of mine. I'm not going to say who my friend is because many of you probably know who this person is because she has a large uh, social media following and uh, she's absolutely amazing. And she reached out to me kind of sheepishly and she said, a um, couple people have been asking me if I would speak at a big event. I know nothing about this. I'm scared to do it, but I've decided that this is something I want to try. Now she made a decision that this is something she wants to walk toward, even though she's scared. And did you notice what she did? She didn't try to figure it out on her own. She reached out to me to ask for help. Now I'm going to coach her. I'm going to tell her everything I know. I have been the most booked female speaker in the world for years. I am one of the most successful motivational speakers on the corporate circuit ever on the planet, male or female. And so 
There are so many mistakes I made trying to do it on my own. When I think about how much I have learned about things like speaking or podcasting or even my marriage or raising kids, the mistake that I make when I try to do it on my own, holy cow, talk about headache and heartache. She's so smart, she made a decision to walk towards something she wants but that she's afraid of, and then she asked for help. Because the secret is once you know that you don't wanna be where you are, that's all you need to know in order to change your life. I don't know where I'm going, I just don't know what, I, I don't wanna stay here. That's a starting spot, that's perfect. That means you started, that's the first rung of the ladder. I'm not staying where I am. The next one is literally figure out what people who have what you want, whether it's just, just people who are happy or what are they doing that you're not doing? There's a little bit of the map. And then you got to ask for help. And so I can think of times in my life where I have been trying to do something new, whether it's fix an issue in my marriage. I don't do that on my own. Are you kidding me? My husband and I, we go to a marriage therapist and ask for help. We talk to very close friends of ours about what's going on and ask for help. Um, when I get serious about wanting to make a change, uh, it's the new Mel Robbins. Mel Robbins, for the first 45 years, I would try to do it in secret. I would try to figure it out on my own. I was embarrassed to tell people that I needed structure and accountability and I needed to be told what to do and I needed somebody to bring some energy. And so I don't do that anymore. That's one of the reasons why my success has skyrocketed. And it's what I'm also doing with now the other areas of my life, happiness, balance, ease, a better business model. I'm freaking asking for help. I'm surrounding myself with people that bring the energy and bring the accountability and bring the structure. And that's exactly what my friend did by texting me. Hey, I know this person that's ahead on the path. I'm going to like, now that I know and I've taken the steps and I've got, I'm, I'm asking her to give me advice to tell me what to do. And so while no one's coming, which I hope is a freaking wake up call for you, I hope that's exactly what you needed to hear right now. In fact, tell me in the comments. What does no one's coming mean to you? And don't be snarky, you know, and sexual about it. I know I went viral on TikTok because some kids made fun of me for saying that. But seriously, what does that mean when you think about your dreams or you think about your life or you think about what you want? That no one is going to come in here and do this work for you. That no one is going to heal you. No one is going to do what you need to do to have the breakthrough that you need in order to create the life that I do not want you to miss out on. Okay. So once you make that decision that you are literally done with where you are, that you are going to do the work. Well, now I'm here. So I have to tell you, I want to help you. I want to be your coach. I'm just going to ask. I want to be your coach. If you have ever thought, wow, how cool would it be to have Mel Robbins as my coach? This is actually the only opportunity you're going to get in 2022. I have decided after reading your DMs and after reading your emails and after seeing what you have gone through, through this pandemic, I'm so proud of you. And guess what? It's time to freaking launch. It's time to launch forward. It's time to shake off the negativity, the sadness, the stuckness, the isolation, and it's time to take control of your life. And that's why I want to be your coach. Seriously. So one of the things that I've struggled with over the course of the past year is how to come to terms with our new reality, our COVID reality, if you will. And no matter what your living situation is like, this pandemic has turned our lives upside down in the sense that we no longer have distinctions between certain aspects of our life, such as work, working out, socializing, since it's all happening under one roof and sometimes within one room. So I would love your advice about how can we not only accept this new reality, but how do we focus on our productivity and our happiness when every day feels like Groundhog Day? So Becca has said the million dollar question, how do you accept this new reality? And that word accept 
is the single most powerful word that I want you to hold on to whenever you're going through any kind of change that has been forced upon you. And look, there isn't a human being on the planet who didn't have their life turned upside down when the pandemic hit. The secret is when life goes upside down, having the emotional resilience and the self-awareness tools to make sure you don't go upside down with it. So how do you do that when the change is hitting you and you don't like the change? Well, as hard as it is, accepting that this is happening is one of the most powerful things that you can do. It's like surrendering to a situation that is outside of your control because resisting what's happening, bitching about what's happening, complaining about what was happening, wishing it would be different. All of those are forms of resisting, pushing against something, not wanting it to happen. And when you resist something, it persists. It sticks around by talking and complaining and wishing that it were different and griping about the pandemic. And I'm so done with blah, 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 blah. You make it bigger. And so a super powerful move is to accept the thing that has happened because lowering your mental resistance creates an expanded level of room for you to then respond to what's happening, okay? And that's where the power is. It's, it's in choosing how you're gonna show up and choosing how you're gonna respond to this thing. And so number one, accept, stop resisting, stop bitching, just accept. Number two, there's this tool that has really helped me uh, through the pandemic in particular. It's also helped me in other moments of my life where there has been something going on that's been incredibly painful um, or that's been heartbreaking or where I've been grieving. And this is a simple mindset tool. And it is remind yourself that this moment is temporary. Remind yourself that this pain is temporary. Remind yourself that this heartbreak is temporary. Remind yourself that even in the case of grieving, the acute, all-consuming grieving and hurt that you feel in the very beginning over time, that levels out. And so that acute pain is temporary. And there's a little thing that I want you to steal from me. It's, a, it's what we call an environmental trigger. It is a positive way to cause a mindset sh switch. And this is the one that I've been using during the pandemic because, you know, it'd be easy to about the pandemic every day. It'd be easy to feel like you just can't take it anymore. It'd be easy to allow yourself to slip into a depression or to just, you know, throw in the towel on your habits and just really let it go in terms of your attitude and your emotional state. Don't do that. You're stronger than that. Remind yourself hey, I didn't, I didn't choose this, but I can ride this wave. And this wave is temporary. And so I want you to, um, in order to leverage this environmental trigger, here's what you're going to do. I want you to fast forward a year. Okay, whatever it is that you're facing right now in your life, the divorce that just got announced, the pandemic that you're in the middle of, the grieving that you're feeling. A year from now, all of that pain is going to be in the rearview mirror. You're going to be stronger, better version of yourself. What is it that you're excited to do a year from now when you're through this moment? And pick something that's realistic that makes you excited. Don't pick the Maldives unless you live next to them. I want you to pick something that you're actually going to do because the being realistic is really important. For me, um, when I think about this pandemic and when I get weary, I say, well, this is temporary. And when this is in the rearview mirror, I'm going to go here. This is a uh, image of uh, the state park in Western Michigan where I grew up. There's a little lighthouse. We used to climb this stone kind of break wall all the way out to the end when I was little. And when um, it's really safe to travel and when my parents have gotten their vaccine, guess what? I'm gonna go home to where I grew up in Western Michigan and I'm gonna go swim in Lake Michigan. And this hangs in my office. And all day long, I sort of glance at it and when I glance at it, it's a subconscious reminder, a positive environmental trigger. It's something in the environment I'm working in that reminds me, oh yeah, this is 
temporary. And here's the final thing about going through a challenge. You've accepted it, so you've stopped resisting it. You're reminding yourself that it's temporary. You are putting an environmental trigger that cues you subconsciously that better days are ahead. And the final thing is, allow yourself to experience some joy right now. Because you're not going to remember the specifics of this moment in your time, but you're going to remember what it felt like. And even if you're suffering, even if you're going through a, an enormous challenge, a, a tremendous loss, even if you're afraid, you can still access joy. You can still step outside and stare at the stars and allow yourself for just a moment to be reminded of the beautiful universe that's around you. You can turn on music and you can have a dance party in your kitchen, even if you're grieving. You can take time out of your day to take care of yourself. You can pull yourself into this moment and notice something that you really love. Like, look at these. You wanna see something amazing? Look at these freaking roses. I bought these at the supermarket. Are they not extraordinary? Look at the pink and the green on the edges. Isn't that fabulous? That brings me so much. They don't smell like anything. But the, the sight of them brings me so much joy. And I can tap into that joy on demand when I want to. Even when I'm going through a challenge. Even when I'm grieving. Even when I'm scared. And being able to tap into that joy on demand like that is what will help you build the resilience to stop resisting what's happening, to remind yourself that this is temporary, to print out some sort of environmental trigger, and to stop and smell the roses. If you train your mind to start spotting evidence as you're doing the work, as you're going through your day, it will help you. If you train your mind to start scanning the world and spotting evidence that yes, indeed, <clears throat> the world is sending you positive signals that things are going to work out. Now, why is it important to train your mind to help you get what you want? Well, the reason why is because if you get into a negative mindset, if you start thinking, shit, this business is never going to work. Why even bother? Or, I'm never going to meet anybody. It's nothing but losers out there. Look at all these idiots on Hinge. Why the hell should I keep doing this? If you allow your mind to start to rest in a pessimistic, negative, protective, scared, and doubtful stance, your mind will continue to show you reasons why there's nobody on Hinge worth talking to. Your mind will continue to show you all the reasons why you will never make it in business. Your mind will continue to show you all the reasons why you're never going to lose that weight and be able to tuck in your shirt, as my friend Corinne Crabtree always talks about, that transformational moment. And when your mind goes negative, your mind starts to scan the world and will show you more reasons to stop. And the power of training your mind to spot positive signs is very simple. The power is that your mind will start to show you reasons to keep going. Your mind will help you take the step. Your mind will encourage you to feel optimistic, to feel empowered. Just like you woke up today on a Tuesday and it was February 22nd. 2022 and those numbers are lining up and that makes you in your heart and soul go whoa something cool could happen today like that shit only happens like once in my lifetime those numbers are going to line up like that today is a really cool day let's go do something with this you could create that kind of attitude every single freaking day of your life you could if you train your mind and if you start taking action and training your mind is the key piece that we're going to talk about so for those of you that have read the high five habit one of the things that i talk about a lot is every single day find a naturally occurring heart-shaped object in the world it could be a stone it could be a leaf it could be a cloud it could be a shape in your coffee hey chris if we've got anything around here that looks like a heart hand it to me and the reason why i love telling you to start playing a game with yourself where you start your day going mind brain show me some heart oh what is this come here Dog treat. Oh my God, it's a dog treat. Look at this, guys. 
What shape is that, bitches? That right there is a heart, bitches! There we go! Check that out. If you say, brain, mind, show me a fucking heart today, guess what's gonna happen? That damn dog biscuit, it's gonna show, it's gonna, you're gonna be like, there's a heart. You're gonna look out at the sky and you're gonna see a heart shape. Oh, right there in the mountains. There's a heart shape in the mountains in Southern Vermont. You're gonna see it in the clouds. What you're doing when you tell your mind what's important to you is you're telling your mind and the filter in your brain to change in real time and allow into your consciousness what's important to you. And if you wanna see hearts, by God, those damn dog treats are gonna start looking like hearts, everybody. That's how you train your mind. It's freaking incredible. And if you want to see evidence of this, follow me on social media. If you follow me, Mel Robbins, on social media, you will see every day I am reposting your stories of finding heart shapes around the world. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because it's a simple way to prove to you that your mind changes in real time. That if you get serious about becoming more positive and optimistic and encouraging of yourself, if you get serious about saying, fuck this, I don't want to see all the reasons why I'm unhappy. I don't want to see uh, everybody else in the world that's launched a business or that's lost weight and is healthy or that has a really good uh, marriage or relationship. And I don't want to see that shit and, and, and have my mind process it as evidence that it's never going to happen for me. I want my mind to reprogram itself and see other people's businesses and see other people getting healthy and see other people in relationships. And I want my mind to say, fuck it, and yeah, if they can do it, I can do it. That's evidence. If that person can get healthy, so can I. If that person can find somebody on Hinge, so can I. If that person can reconcile with their child, so can I. Other people can become evidence that you can have it too. Right now, your mind is so fucked up from your past that when you see what other people have and you don't have it, you can't actually translate it through a negative mind and, and see that that's evidence that you're going to win. You see it like, oh, somebody already stole what I wanted. That sucks. And so what I want to start to open your mind to is that you have the power to train your mind to filter the world differently. Just like you woke up and you saw the date today, 2-22-22, and your brain saw that and was like, whoa, this is a once in a lifetime day, everybody. You are never going to have another day that lines up like this, ever. What are you gonna do with this day? Your mind already interpreted this as, wow, something cool could happen. And if you tell yourself something amazing is gonna happen today, Something will, because you're going to be looking for it. I swear to God, something will. Something will. If you want to see the good all around you, you got to tell your mind you want to see the good. And this just isn't a bunch of horse shit, everybody. This isn't toxic positivity. There is a filter in your brain called the reticular activating system. The reticular activating system. I call it the RAS. I like to think about it like a giant hairnet on your head. And this RAS sits over your brain, I'm probably getting this wrong, I'm not a neuroscientist, I could give a shit about getting it right, I just need you to know the basics here so that you can apply it to your life, okay? You don't need a PhD to use the science that super smart people have been working really hard on in order to apply it to your life. That's what I'm here for in your life. I'm here to translate this stuff into simple, believable, and actionable things that you can do to take all this super cool stuff that people are researching and apply it to your normal person's everyday life to help you change from the inside out. And one of the coolest things that you have at your disposal is you have a whole system in your body that you can train and change. And one of those things that you can train and change that is impacted by that real that word you're hearing a lot of neuroplasticity that just means that things are able to twist and bend and change and you're able to learn new things for as long as you're alive as long as you're breathing everybody you got a chance to change the way that you think as long as you are breathing you got a chance to change from the inside out how you experience your life as long as you are still here watching me people you got a chance to create a new experience in your life. And one of the things that helps a lot 
is understanding that right now all of the bullshit from your past has jammed the filter in your mind body and spirit the reticular activating system and it is clouding your ability to look at the world around you and see hearts remember this dog treat hearts bitches look at that there's a heart right there if I I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you I want you to find a heart today and I want you to tag me at Mel Robbins when you do okay tag me whoa we got somebody whose birthday is today damn you better declare something amazing on 2 22 22 that's freaking awesome fabulous for you so here's the thing your past has completely fucked up the reticular activity system the reason why you doubt yourself the reason why you think nothing works out for you the reason why you're seeking validation from everybody else is because your life trained you to do that and I'm here to tell you you can wake the hell up and you can realize that from this moment forward you have the ability using simple and believable tools to reclaim your mind body and spirit to retrain it and to use it to help you feel the way that you want to feel to experience life the way that you want to experience life and to build a sense of momentum as you go through your day and you start to see all kinds of stuff around you as evidence that you can have it too. I'll give you a simple example. So as many of you know, um, for a very long time, I've always wanted to launch a podcast. I got my start in the media business back in 2007 by having a local radio show in Boston, Massachusetts on a talk radio station on Saturday mornings. That's what I did. I made $25 an hour. I hosted a show for two hours, a live call-in show where we talked about what was going on in the world. It was an advice show. I absolutely loved it. And from there, uh, that show grew. It then uh, became a Sunday night show in Atlanta. And then I got a five day a week show in Orlando. So you're looking at a woman who got her start in the media business doing local radio. I paid for our kids' braces by reading Invisalign ads for the local dentist. So I have been in sort of the radio or podcast business since 2007, since before podcasts. And then my life took detours like it did. I have not been in radio since, God, 2011, maybe? So a long time, 10 years. And I've been thinking about launching a podcast for five years, everybody. Five years. And every time I would think about it, my mind would look around and my mind, my reticular activity system, the filter in my brain was clogged with all kinds of crap. And when I looked around and I saw all these people launching podcasts, that fact of seeing it would filter through my mind and my mind would say there's no room for you you're too late you're not going to be as good as those other people so my mind was looking at the outside world and the fact that everybody and their mother was launching a podcast five years ago and they still are today and it would pass through the filter in my brain and my brain would say to me Mel you're fucked. You might as well just stop thinking about it because you're too late, woman. How many of you do that to yourself? That you see other people having what you want and the way that that fact that somebody else has gotten healthy or somebody else has made a million dollars or somebody else has launched a business online or somebody else has found somebody after divorce and is happier than ever and you see that and you immediately assume, I'm fucked. Like, it's never going to happen for me. Instead of having your brain go, whoa, look at that. Look at all these people out there doing this. If they can do it, you can do it too, Mel. Look at that. You got all these people that can give you advice. You got all these people that are lights on the path that you want to walk down. How cool is that? You got all kinds of information, all kinds of help, all kinds of evidence that's positive. Well, the reason why my mind didn't see it as positive is the same reason why your mind does not see everybody else's business and everybody else's health journey and everybody else's bank account and everybody else's fancy vacations. Or when you walk into a bar and all your girlfriends get hit on instead of you, your mind does not see all of that as evidence that it's going to eventually work out for you because your mind is clogged with all kinds of crap from your past. And I'm here to tell you, when you wake up and realize 
that you could train your brain to wake up every day and go, holy shit, today's going to be a magical day. Today is going to be that 2 22, 22 day where you immediately see this. You know this is the one day of your life where this is going to be the day. Come on in, Jesse. Jesse's here. Hey, YOLO. YOLO, come on in. You could, you could literally train your mind to wake up every day and go, damn it, I'm going to see a heart today and I'm going to see evidence today that shit's working out for me. And when my mind starts to see that this is going to work out for me, I'm going to feel more empowered, I'm going to feel more inspired, and I'm going to keep going. Because the bottom line is, everybody, your positive mindset helps you with momentum, repetition, and discipline. Your positive mindset helps you by encouraging you to take the action. Because as you know, because you hang out with me, Mel Robbins, thinking about changing your life is not going to change your fucking life. The only thing that changes your life is action. You want something different, you got to do something different. But a filter in your brain that filters the world in a positive way, in an encouraging way, a filter in your brain that acts more like that annoying friend. You know that annoying friend who's always trying to, to build you up? And I say annoying because when you're committed to being like, it's never working out for me. I'm never going to meet anybody. I'm never going to lose the weight. And your friend's like, oh, are you kidding? You know how amazing you are? You're like, fuck off. Don't tell me I'm amazing. I want to feel terrible. So when you start to change your brain, when you start to really go to work on this filter, you're going to turn your own mind from a critic and somebody who's nasty into that friend that's really cheering you on. See, see, this is going to work out for you. See, you should keep going. See, this is really good for you to do. And that's why it's important. It's really hard to take action when you have a shitty mindset. It's really hard to find what's called the activation energy, the force to push yourself through the resistance and the fear. If you are committed to believing that it's not worth doing anyway. And so action is critical. Action is where the five second rule comes in. But if you want to supersize this and step on the accelerator, you must start to train your mind. And one way you can start to do this is to look for hearts every day. That's one chapter in the book we haven't read yet. See, this is a dog treat that was shaped like a heart. I asked Chris, he scanned the room. Boom, bitches, that's how this works. The other way that you can start to train your mind is to learn about the filter in your brain, to learn about the fact that this filter in your mind has the ability to change in real time what you see. First of all, I, it would be really smart of me to write down a long list of what I want in this next chapter of my life, for real, yes. and the why. And you explain that in the example around legacy. So if what I'm really after is more peace, a hell of a lot more fun, and a greater impact with more ease, um, I need to unpack what does that actually mean yes. and get very clear about the why. And I know that the why has to do with more time with family, more time with friends, more uh, time and space to do bigger thinking instead of racing around being busy. Yeah. Um, the second thing that I got for out of this is very like radical. And that is when the fear or the anxiety or the worry or the self-doubt that little, like we're gonna talk about the negative bitch first before mm -hmm. we talk about the whisper. The negative bitch in your head is just your ego trying to protect you. Yeah. And so when that anxiety comes up or I wake up and I feel like that hot lava on my neck and my thoughts start to swirl, don't try to outrun it, face the bitch and be like, all right, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you think I'm gonna be lonely on a mountain because I'm lonely in suburbia. You think I'm not gonna have any friends there because I don't have friends here. Okay, you think I'm not gonna be successful doing it there because I'm not like, oh, okay, okay. And hear it. And then the way that you take the bitch and you flip her into your best friend is you say, what is this trying to warn me? What is this trying to coach me? What are the things that it's saying? Hey, 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 hey. If you're gonna go do this, just 
know that you might feel lonely and that's okay. So what are you going to do about it? If you're going to go do this, just know that you should probably, you know, reach out to friends that are doing podcasts from remote places. If you're going to do this so that you know what steps to take, and it's in taking the steps forward to prepare for plan B. Yeah. So that you got a plan for when that stuff happens that is going to allow you to access access the radical confidence, which feels radical in a moment where you're doubting yourself. And you just keep pushing forward and you do it over and over and over and over and over again. Because you know what's interesting is you also said this thing about the whisper, that the things that are meant for you and the things that are true begin as a whisper. Mm -hmm. And when you really start to hear the whisper, whether it's, I'm going to sign up for this program, even though it scares me, or I'm going to not have kids and sit down with my spouse, even though it scares me, or I'm going to, you know, make a major life change and it scares me. As you start to hear the whisper, I think there's a pretty close period of time where that whisper turns into a fucking bitch. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Well, because she's like, hang on a minute, you're freaking ignoring me. Let me get my megaphone so that you don't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then that last piece is making sure that you understand your belief, uh, why you feel the way you do actually, Mel, because you even said your parents never moved out of their house that you were born in, correct? Your grandparents never did. So you have a somewhat of, it seems like a belief system that being holding on to the house that maybe your kids were brought up in is something, may, and I don't want to speak for you, but maybe something you feel like you should do. Or maybe feel like it's something that you saw your parents do. And now you're actually breaking that pattern. And for me, it was the same. My entire, my literally, my grand, uh, my grandparents, my, um, my mom, everyone ended up like basically thinking that I would be this stay at home wife. Or I would be a mother. And in order for me to listen to the silence and break that, I had to say, oh, it's because I believed that this was what was going to happen. I never questioned it. So I don't know if you've ever questioned whether you, you know, the, the house that you're in, whether it should be something that you should be in for the rest of your life, or if it was just an, um, a belief system you hold on to. It's just a belief system I hold on to. Like, I know, just like you knew, at some point that was where became the truth for you. Right, right. I know that it's the truth. And everybody that knows me well is literally like, I thought you would have sold that house like years ago because like with the amount of stuff you're doing and like just, it just doesn't make sense for you to live there. And so like somebody else saw it in you. First. Yes. Oh my God. Yes, exactly. And Cause, now you know, because it's like, cause when I talk to you uh, and I saw other friends of ours last week because they were visiting Boston and I was sort of going like in the beginning of the freaking crest downfall. And it was Joel Marin and, and Kat and Kat looks at me and she's like, wait, wait, are we really having this conversation? You're, you're like worried about like some place in Vermont, whether you're going to live in an apartment, whether you're going to feel like you're Mel fucking Robbins. What the fuck? Like, and I'm like, you're right. I know how to do that. Why am I? Because mm -hmm. of human and because your ego comes in and because if you keep running, this shit will catch up with you, which is why radical confidence is really about turning and facing it. Yeah. Instead of being and, afraid of it. And then knowing that the, the path you choose to take in life will mean that you leave things behind. And that's where the morning piece comes in. It's like, just because you're making a decision that's right for you shouldn't mean that you shouldn't embrace that you have to mourn the life that you're leaving behind or the life you thought you were going to live. So maybe Mel, for, your, for when you had your kids, and I, again, don't know, but maybe you're just like, this is the house that I'm going to bring them up in. And you've told yourself year after year after year that that's going to be the house. But now you've changed. Now your goals have changed. Now your life has changed. And now your reassessment of that isn't the same with a person who maybe first had those children. Oh, I know what it and is. You're giving me another breakthrough. D dude, I need to pay you for this. No, I'm here for you. You're my bestie. You know that. I literally feel like you just saved me. Uh, no offense to SSRIs, but I'm like, I'm feeling like I'm, 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 I'm like back. I'm feeling like the woman that craw crawled out of the crypt this morning and my team had to like prop up and be like, oh God, Mel is not Mel today. 
that you have brought me back, woman. This is so weird. You know how thoughts are expand? Yeah. yeah. All I do is think about you. You're my favorite on there. Her personality, you should go get her. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. I've been looking at you. I've been doing research on all that stuff, and, and here you are. It's so crazy. Well, you know why I think that happens? I think that there's something that you're thinking about doing, and I'm a physical sign wow. that it's time to cut off with the self-doubt and the fear oh and all that stuff, God. and I'm actually sitting at this table. So what is it? Well... I, I wanted to I have a real estate license. I yeah. haven't even been able to do it because I'm trying to make money, you know. But I want to write a book. I want Great. to write. I want to write a book so bad. And so what's the book about? I want it to be a great book because I'm a romance person. But, okay. But I'm thinking child, like children, you know, like E.B. the Flying Dragon, you know. <laughs> it can be anything you want. So, do you want me to give you advice? Sure, thank you. I can't believe I'm sitting at the table with you. I didn't want to bother you. I thought I saw you on the phone. It's just crazy. Well, that's nuts. I'm I sorry. would imagine that since you follow me, you yes. know that I would be mad at you if you didn't say hello. Yeah, I don't. I don't like every day, but I, but for the past month, like at least all on the weekends, like yeah. every weekend, you're the one I go to. I just. I love you. I'm sorry. That's so great. I, I love you too. I think it's I love amazing. It's awesome that you're here. So what I'm going to tell you is that you need to start acting like a published author. And let me tell you what that means. Every single morning, I want you to sit down and open up a notebook. And I want you to write for just five minutes. That's it. And I want you to write for a hundred days in a row. And I want it to be just the shittiest blob oh, that comes that out, <laughs> right? Because I want you to get all to of the, the side, garbage out, again, right? I'll wait till she goes. So if you, writers write, the secret to changing yourself and changing your life is to simply take action every day that's consistent with where you're going, not where you are. What if, what if somebody has so many things though that they're trying to do? Like, like I have probably three different jobs. Okay. So what, okay. you know, how do you, so how do you focus on, so just focus on the book if that's the thing. I well, wanna. here's why I'm telling you to just write for 10 minutes every day. It will help you build the muscle of consistency. It will help you by making it really small, just 10 minutes to act like the person you want to become that is a skill. So if you can practice that for a hundred days, just five minutes a day, opening up your notebook, you got a notebook right over there. Yep. See the notebook right there? You're just gonna <laughs> write, a, write for five minutes. Even if it's garbage, even if you some days open up the thing and you can't think of a thing, right? I can't think of anything to say. This is stupid. I hate that I committed to this to Mel Robbins. I want you to do that every day. And I also, if you want to supersize it, take a photo and post it on your story and tag me. Mel, it's day 23. Photo of you with your little notebook, okay? Wow, okay. If you push yourself every day to write for just 10, five minutes, that's it. And you show up every day consistently. And even if you miss a day, you show up again the next day. You are building a new muscle. And that muscle is the muscle of simple discipline. And if you can do that with simply writing for five minutes, you can then add something about real estate. Meaning, after you've practiced for 100 days, if you want to sell real estate but you're not taking the actions to do it, once you're starting to develop this muscle and you see yourself going, oh, I can make a promise. I can commit five minutes a day. Once you start to feel that momentum, you can add, I'm going to also add one thing a day about real estate. That's awesome. <laughs> See, your life goes off the rails by all those little moments you hesitate, all those little moments you overthink, all those little moments that you feel overwhelmed. Because when you start to think or feel all those negative emotions, it triggers you to take no action. Right. So your life goes in the wrong direction by thinking too much. And it's all those little moments where you stop and think that are kind of piling up. You turn your life in a new direction 
by focusing on small micro actions. Just for five minutes a day. It's it, just small little micro actions. It's not gonna feel like anything, but it's gonna start to build. And you're gonna start to feel a sense of momentum. And you're also gonna start to feel a sense of pride in yourself because you are doing something you said you would do. And that is the beginning of all change, watching yourself show up for yourself. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. That is so sweet. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I, it's just crazy. I'm sorry. It's cr it, And don't doubt this. You said a book. This doesn't mean you have to write a book. Right. The book is a vehicle to practice behavior change. Right. Have you ever signed? You've never signed one. Well, I was always riddled with anxiety. Yeah. And... I think that me being extroverted or me anxious, you're excited, right? Yeah. Oh my God, that's right. <laughs> oh, Roberto, better get on that flight. You know what I'm saying? Roberto, you interrupted our conversation right now. But I love her commitment to getting him on that plane. Um, I think when I was younger, I was outgoing or loud, but terrified inside. And it was it just like some folks pull back because they're nervous or insecure. There are some people like me who are a little bit louder and go first because I felt like if I went first or I spoke up first, I'd be in control. Okay. Versus sitting back, yes. terrified that you yeah. know I'd get called on or when I would think about it. More. Wow, that was so true. Yeah, thank you so You're much. You're welcome. Thank You're you. welcome. Have you stopped to consider that the best place to make a change is by letting go of things, of projects, of thinking patterns, of relationships that no longer serve you? And the big question is how? How do you know when it's time? And I have got not only a fantastic visual metaphor to help you understand this concept, but I also have a really interesting way to approach this. We're going to talk about the fact that your energy and your intuition is always there to tell you when it's time to let something go because it no longer serves you. So to get into this topic, I want to introduce the metaphor. And it was the metaphor I had started talking about as we were on that hike together. I mean, here in the United States anyways, it is autumn. It is the fall season. We are all about pumpkins. We are in harvest time. There are corn stalks everywhere. We're getting ready for orange and red and all those amazing colors and carrot cake. I mean, I love this time of year. And I realize it may not be fall where you are. Uh, if you're you know, part of our global fan base halfway around the world, it's summertime. Don't get hung up on the fact that I'm using fall as a metaphor. I personally believe whenever it is that you are listening to this episode, even if it's two years from now, you're listening to this right now because you are meant to hear it right now. Because there is a new season that needs to start in your life. And that's going to require you to let go of things that no longer serve you. And so let's talk about the metaphor of what happens to a tree when the fall season hits. And in researching this for you, because, you know, it's one thing to just kind of tell you a metaphor. It's another thing to really understand it and explain it. This was fascinating. I know we, we learned about chlorophyll and fall and the life cycle of a tree in elementary school, but I had forgotten most of this stuff. So check this out. The reason why a tree has leaves is because the tree needs energy to survive. It needs energy to grow. And the leaves have a very particular purpose. The leaves are there to take the sunlight and convert it to energy so that the tree can grow. And in exchange, the tree gives a ton of water back to these leaves. I mean, this process of the leaves sprouting and the leaves growing and the leaves taking its surface area and converting the sun into energy so the tree can go from a tiny little acorn to a mighty oak, that is a lot of energy. 
And there's this reciprocal nature to the relationship that a tree has to its leaves because the tree has to bring in tons of water in order to fuel this energy exchange. And here's the reason why leaves fall off a tree. In the middle of winter, at least here in the United States, when the ground is frozen and snowpack is on top, there is no water for the tree. And if those leaves with their big flat surface were to stay on that tree through winter, the leaves would kill the tree. It would suck the tree dry of all the water that it needs. An interesting thing about fall is that, you know, we look at the, the leaves turning and we look at the leaves dropping gently and falling down to the ground as this beautiful thing that happens this natural thing that happens. It's so lovely. It's just wonderful. Isn't this delightful? Do you want to know that this is almost like a violent act? That the trees are pushing those leaves off its branches. The tree is basically going, yo, uh, if you are hanging around on my branches through the wintertime, you are going to suck me dry of all my energy. I am going to die if you don't get off my freaking branches. The tree literally pushes them, ejects them, kicks them out of their life. Why? Because there is no reciprocal energy exchange that can happen during the winter. The tree has to conserve its energy to survive. And after the winter season, once those leaves are gone and the tree can conserve its energy instead of giving it all to that leaf, while killing itself. I bet you got areas of your life where you're giving all your energy into a relationship or into your work or into some stupid thinking pattern that you've been doing for years that makes you feel bad. You put all your energy in one direction. You get nothing in return. That's what fall is for a tree. The fall season for a tree is, thank you very much for spring and summer. You were amazing. This relationship between the leaf and the tree, this was reciprocal. You got energy from me. I got energy from you. Bada bing, bada boom. And then all of a sudden, boom. This is a one-way thing. And if I hold on to these leaves, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I'm bringing that metaphor and that visual and that, that, that documented point of view, that this isn't just some lovely thing where the leaves, you know, change colors and it's so beautiful and now we all drink a pup pumpkin spice latte. That's not what this is. This is a tree's survival. This is about energy. This is about the fact that in order to grow, in order to be strong, to be the best you, you got to surround yourself with relationships and work and projects and friendships and habits where there is an equal reciprocal exchange that you give and you get and return. And that's where we're going to start when it comes to how I want you to think about this concept of letting go. We're going to talk about how to identify that moment when there is no longer that energy exchange, that there is something that has become a complete energy suck. And when you realize whether it's a friendship or a romantic relationship or a job or some habit or a place that you live, when you realize that something has become an energy suck on you, that's when you know it's time to let go. That's when you know, like that tree, that you better kick that thing off your branches because it's hanging on to you or you're holding on to it. And if you keep doing that, what will happen? And you've had this happen in your life where you've held on to things for too long, where you refused to let things go. And what did it do? It sucked you dry. It sucked you dry of your energy. It sucked you dry of your vitality. It made you feel depleted. Instead of those leaves or that project or that person withering away and, and falling to the ground so that you could regain your strength, so that you could step into a new season of your life, no, you gave it all to them. You held on for too long. Well, guess what? That's not happening anymore. 
because what we're going to talk about when we come back from a short word from our sponsors, which I want you to listen to, because by the way, our sponsors, they're the reason why I can show up twice a week. There is a reciprocal exchange between us. They literally pay for this show, which is why I'm so enthusiastic about it. So we can put this out there around the world for free. So I want to give an energy exchange back to the amazing sponsors of the Mel Robbins podcast. Take a listen. We're going to be right back. Because we're going to now talk about, in detail, what do I mean by reciprocal energy exchange? And where are the major areas in your life where you tend to start to have this be a one-way thing, where you're given all the energy and you're the one that's depleted and dry? All right. I'll be right back. You hang on to my branches. We're not done yet. It's really green right now, which means these trees are holding on to it. Chlorophyll. That chlorophyll is coming through, but in literally a matter of days, the green is gonna leave those leaves, yellow, orange, red, brown, purple. It's gonna take over and those leaves will have served their purpose and they will all of a sudden wither away and fall to the ground. That was Mel Robbins, your friend who has a degree in botany. No, just kidding. I uh, wanna touch on one point from what I said on the trail before we get into this energy exchange and how you're going to use your intuition and the fact that you deserve to have an exchange, a reciprocal nature to what you give and what you receive back from it. I want to talk about one thing that I said, which is the leaves served their purpose. When the leaves are green, the leaves are bringing energy to the tree, and the tree is returning energy in the form of water. The reason why the leaves start to change is because the tree starts to pull back. The tree starts pulling back on the amount of water that it is sending to the leaves. The tree is starting to let go. The leaf no longer serves a purpose. And this is an important thing to say because so often we have trouble letting go of friendships, of habits, of jobs, of, for me, where I lived and raised our kids for 26 years. We recently sold our home. And by God, I held on to that for probably two years longer than we needed to because I had trouble letting go go. But what I want you to focus on is that when something has a purpose in your life, that's an amazing thing. And it's also normal for something to serve a purpose during a specific period of time and to no longer serve a purpose in your life now or in the life you want to create. And so when you honor that a friendship served a purpose, and a really good example of this is, you know how whenever you um, have a new job or you move an apartment or you move to a city, that all of a sudden the patterns in your life change and your friendships change. And your friendships change because now you're doing different things. So you're bumping into different people. It doesn't mean that you're no longer friends with the people that you used to hang out with at work. But the friends that you had at work served a particular important purpose during that period of your life. There was an equal exchange back and forth. What you gave, you received back. It's why you ate lunch with the same people every day. You enjoyed them and they enjoyed you. But now that you live somewhere else, putting a ton of energy back into that relationship when you're not going to get the same back, it doesn't serve the same purpose. And that's why when you let go of friendships, you also need to let go of the judgment on yourself, like there's something wrong with me, and am I doing something wrong, and do I have any friends? Of course you have friends. The patterns of your life have changed. You're putting energy somewhere else because you're getting energy from somewhere else. This is the natural cycle of life. It's the natural cycle of relationships. And I find that when you really honor the things that you need to let go of, whether it's a job you no longer like or a house you no longer want to live in 
or a friendship you don't see very often, or maybe it's some habit. Maybe it's some habit that you used to have. So when you say something serves a purpose, you actually honor. You honor the energy it used to give you. You honor the fact that you put something into it. And you also honor the fact that not everything is going to be in your life forever. And that's what allows you to let go. You start to let go when you realize that holding on to things is holding you back. And in particular, holding on to the guilt and the judgment that you layer onto yourself that you should, but I feel guilty, but this, but that, that is definitely holding you back from creating a new life and from creating space for something new to happen. And see, that's one of the reasons why you have to learn how to let go. Because when you continue to pour your energy into things that no longer give you energy back, it's going to kill you. It's going to kill your happiness. It's going to kill your vitality. It destroys your motivation. It makes you feel depleted. It makes you feel like you're the last on your list. And so that's reason number one. And the second reason why you have to start to let go of what doesn't serve you is because as long as you are holding on to the old stuff, you have no time, no space, and no motivation to create anything new, period. And you know this. So let's now jump into how. How do I use this energy exchange and my intuition to spot the things that are draining me dry and to let them go, push them off the branches, get them out of my life, thank them for their purpose and their service, but then get out of here because you need to make room for something new and better and energizing. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah, you better believe it sounds good. So let's do it. And one of the reasons why I want you to really focus on energy is because your energy doesn't lie. I mean, just for a second with me, just take a second. Whether you're out there walking the dog or you're driving around in your car or you're working from home or you're busy doing a bunch of stuff, I want you to just stop for a second. And I want you to assess right now. What's your energy level? Think about a fuel gauge in a car. Empty to full. Empty in a human being means you feel depleted, you feel burnt out, you feel checked out, you feel like your whole life is basically pouring energy into everything else. Full in a human being basically means that you're energized, you're excited, you feel like the things that you're pouring yourself into, your habits, your routine, the people you're surrounded with, the projects you're working on, it may be difficult, but it's bringing energy back into your life too. Your energy never lies. We are energetic human beings. And I know that sounds woo-woo. We can get into the neuroscience on that on a totally different episode, but let me prove it to you. Have you ever walked into, say, a coffee shop and the person that is behind the counter is having the world's worst day? They are super grumpy. It doesn't matter how big your smile is. It doesn't matter how nice you are. They are like, ugh, ugh, ugh. That energy actually impacts you, just like your positive energy can impact somebody else. Energy is contagious, and most importantly, when you hang out with your friend Mel Robbins, I'm going to teach you to start to pay attention to it, and I'm going to teach you to trust it, because energy is also tied to intuition. And we're going to get into this tool of how do you assess is something giving me positive energy? Is something giving me negative energy? Is this uh, a relationship that is one way? Or is this something that gives me something in return? That is the tool we're going to talk about today. And what if the very next morning you walk into the coffee shop and you're having a bad day? Like one of your pets is really sick and it just is really bumming you out. And you're feeling really low. And the person behind the counter is just the nicest person on the planet. And they look you in the eyes and they give you a big smile and they uh, are really cheery and they compliment you. And they maybe even ask you, hey, how you doing? You're like, oh, I'm not doing so great. You know, oh, I'm really sorry. Coffee's on me. How do you feel? You feel better because they poured their positive energy into you and that lifted you up. 
energy is contagious. It also always tells the truth. It's like a compass. In fact, a compass runs on magnetic energy. That's why a compass always points true north. It never lies. Your energy doesn't lie either. It's why you feel kind of off around certain people. It's why if somebody texts you and you don't like them, you, you're like, ugh. But if you like the person, you're like, oh, yeah, cool. Energy never lies. So let's talk about how we're going to use it, okay? So I'm going to break the topic of letting go into two different types of situations. And in each one, I'm going to explain how to use energy and paying attention to the energy inside you, both that you're giving, that you're feeling, and that you're receiving back in order to know when it's time to let go. So situation number one is super easy. And this is typically uh, when it has to do with things or projects or a job or somebody who's like really, really engaging in toxic behavior. Okay, this is the easy stuff. This is when you have a flood of negativity around something. And I'm going to give you a bunch of examples of this, okay? So we all have a pair of pants that we're holding on to from high school or before we were pregnant or whenever that we can't freaking fit into. When you stare at those things, you're reminded that you can't fit in them. When you try to wiggle them on, especially after a shower, you feel terrible about yourself. That is something that is an example. You need to let go of that. That job that you walk into where there is a pit in your stomach and you gripe about it to your friends and you spend all this energy pouring into why you hate it and resist it, you need to find another job. That friend that does nothing but gossip and roll their eyes and drag you down and literally is such a bad influence on you, you need to let them go. And what does that mean? Well, that depends on you. Donate the pants for sure. Start redirecting your energy from complaining about your job to directing energy to looking for a new one. I mean, just imagine, that's the other thing about this. Do you know how much energy and time and effort you waste focusing on resistance and and complaining? If you were to just stop complaining, for a day about something that gives you negative energy, like your job or your parents or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your roommates, what if you stopped complaining? Because that's negative energy pouring out and you directed that same effort towards something positive, like fixing it or letting it go and creating something new that makes you feel good. Like I relate to that because I think I've spent a lot of my life pouring negative energy at things that I didn't really like instead of realizing I needed to complete this. I needed to let this go. The, the, The roommate served a purpose two years ago. Not a fit right now, and that's okay. Time to kick the leaves off the branches. You know what I'm saying? Time to save myself instead of pouring everything into either another person or my energy into being upset and frustrated and disappointed. So when you have things that are for sure 100% zapping your energy or you find yourself complaining, griping, resisting, let go. And you can do that in two ways. Obviously, donate, throw out, delete is one. The other one is take all that negative resistance that you feel in you that churns and pour it into something positive. If you can't quit your job, for example, because you need to pay the bills, no problem. Instead of complaining, instead of feeling resistant, spend 30 minutes every morning before you go to work looking for a new one. Or spend 30 minutes every morning pouring positive energy into a hobby or a project or a side hustle that brings you positive energy. And when you start to do that, you start to lift yourself up because you are now getting this reciprocal exchange by pouring energy and attention into something new and something positive. And that's going to lift you up. And by the way, that will also change your experience of that current job that you hate. I know this because I've done it. I remember being uh, right out of, uh, let's see, how old was I? I was 30 years old. I was pregnant with our daughter, who's now 23. And we had moved to Boston from New York City, where I had been a public defender. 
And I love that job working for legal aid. And so we moved to Boston. I do not have a license to practice in Massachusetts, so I could not work for the public defender's office. I have to take the bar, but I've got bills to pay. So I get a job in this huge law firm. And working in a law firm is the exact opposite of being a public defender. When I worked in New York City for legal aid, I was in court five days a week from eight o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the afternoon. That was my job. I was on my feet. I was, you know, negotiating plea deals. I was talking to witnesses and police officers and judges and pro- like that, going to clients, going to Rikers, all of it. When you get a job in a large law firm, you literally go into a high rise and sit in an office and write all day. It was the exact opposite of what I am wired to do. I knew the moment I got that job that I was going to hate it. And for a year, I would get on the commuter rail and I would commute in for 45 minutes and then I would get off the commuter rail and I would clomp, 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 clomp over to the building and then I would get in the elevator and then I would take the elevator up to like whatever, the 23rd floor, and then I'd clomp, 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 clomp. I'd go into my office and shut the door. And from the moment I woke up every morning, I felt depleted. The closer I got to that office as that train clunk, 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 clunk down the tracks towards Boston, the more resistance I felt. I got nothing in return from that job. Yes, I got a paycheck and I needed it. So it served a purpose. But I was getting nothing of value back. Because when I looked at the partners in the law firm, I knew damn well that's not the life I wanted. I knew that this was not a fit for me. But I'll, I'll tell you, I, I made the mistake that everybody makes. Instead of recognizing that that's how I felt, instead of channeling all of that angst and resistance and ugh into looking for something else, I sat there miserable and I felt depleted and I felt awful. And I'm going to confess this to you. I didn't even take the advice then. You know what happened to me? I got pregnant and I had a baby and I went on maternity leave. And when I was on maternity leave, that's when, with distance from it, I was like, okay, there is no way I'm going back there. No way. Now that I have escaped, there is no way I'm going back. And we've all had exes like that, right? Where you're like in it for so long, you finally let it go and break off. And they're like, what the hell was I thinking now that I'm on the other side and I'm away from that like energy suck? I don't want to go back to the like energy sucker vampire thing. What the hell? But when you're in it, That negativity vortex can keep you spinning and stuck. You convince yourself, but I need the money, but I can't do this. And then you're so depleted from your complaining and the outpouring of energy and the wrong thing that you're just stuck, stuck, stuck. That was me. So I get pregnant. I go on maternity leave. Holy cow, I am free from the vortex of negativity. Uh, I've been let go, but now I got to go back. And so my husband, Chris, says to me, look, I know you don't want to go back, but here's the problem, Mel. We have a mortgage and we have a baby. And you will go crazy being home. And so here's the thing. You need to find a job. Your maternity leave ends in exactly three months. So that means you have 12 weeks to find a job. And you have to make $60,000 a year. That's it. And you know what's interesting? If you give a human being a problem to solve, we get pretty creative. And I'll tell you what, the night before my maternity leave... I not only landed a job, it wasn't for 60 grand, it was for 55, but that was enough. And I walked in the next day and I let go. I, I, what do you say? I, I guess I quit, but you know, they, they didn't let me go. I quit. But so what I'm trying to say is do not make the mistake that 30 year old Mel Robbins made. Do not do that to yourself. Do not waste a year of your life spinning in that negativity energy vortex. Your body knows. Your spirit knows. Get rid of those pants. Push that project to the side that you don't feel inspired to work on anymore. Let it go because it is sucking your vitality dry. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe.